Hey, Eric, are you presenting? We're not hearing anything. Can you hear me now? Yeah, barely. No, I need the output channel. Oh. You have, to, you have to enable them both at the same time. Oh, sorry. Sorry. You said so. Can you guys hear me now? Kinda. How about now? Yes, that's much better. There. Is that better? All right, so we'll try this again. Uh, so for those who just saw a bunch of nothing and no, our stuff with no audio, apparently my Google Hangouts like to die when I start presenting. Um, but this is the Catello Sprint 38 demo. Um, we'll be showing a variety of stuff in the era of areas of errata, um, Docker, Foreman tasks. Um, and to start with, uh, just uh, a few notes about some documentation updates that uh, we've worked on. Um, as part of Catella 2.0, we've tried to make it a priority to write user guides and increase our documentation to make it easier for users to get on board um, with some of our concepts and entities. Um, so we've added uh, a capsule guide uh, to walk users through how to deploy a capsule, um, requirements, uh, and uh, we've also ported over the Catello Disconnected Guide, um, as well as adding a small uh, CLI guide uh, for users to start getting on board with that. All right. That is all for myself. Um, so next up is... Walden uh, to show the updates we've made in the area of uh, errata. I'm sorry. All right, cool. Can y'all see my screen? You got that audio off over there? Just one second, sorry. You're good. I took a long time to mute. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to go in reverse order from what the, uh, um, what the agenda says. And this is the... Um, the content host page, and you'll notice the um, errata totals here that we've added um, that are broken up by type. Uh, should look similar to the content view versions page. Um, and then here's a new errata list page. And just list all the errata. Um, scroll. Um, if you go to an individual errata, you'll see uh, this details page that um, looks similar to what you'll see on the portal with uh, all the stuff, including the affected packages down at the bottom there. Um, we are going to be adding uh, affected systems tab here soon as well, um, and you'll be able to apply router from there. Uh, but that's that's pretty much it. Um, unless there's any questions. And if not, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Justin. You all muted.
Great. Alrighty, um, I've got a few different sort of random things to show. Um, first, as part of uh, GA and, and even Catella community users, um, whenever they go to, oh, let's see. On the recording. Okay. Um, whenever they go to enable a repository, if there's some sort of networking error or um, some sort of issue, they they really don't get any feedback. They just see um, the list expand and nothing show up. So the the goal of this and this is actually a zstream bug was to bubble up the errors and provide a little bit more information to the user that something actually went wrong that they could then get help on um, from support. So here I've, I'll change the CDN URL to something that doesn't actually make sense to simulate a networking error. And then um, if I try to enable a repository, for example, that had Enterprise Linux desktop, It'll attempt to connect to the CDN and should come back with an error. So we see name or service not known, which is infinitely more helpful than nothing. Um, and there's actually a link to failed task in Dynflow. So they, the user could click on errors and have um, this type of information to send in to support to try to debug the uh, scenario. Um, also, if you actually make it past the listing of the repositories, so for example, if the CDN, if I can actually contact the CDN, but something goes wrong enabling the repository, for example, The CDN tells us that there potentially is a Red Hat Enterprise Linux desktop Oracle Java RPMs for RHEL 5.7, um, but I can assure you there is not. So previously when we click this, I think it would just uncheck um, since an error occurred, but now we get an error saying that um, i386 and 5.7 are not valid for, for that repository. So at least give some sort of indication of, of what went wrong that's more easily explainable. Um, I have a question. Sure. So that they should, it's trying to connect to CDN because it's trying to substitute the URL. So now, in this case, that repository doesn't actually exist. The, CD, the CDN tells us it does, but it doesn't actually exist. So this, you, could, you could say that's a problem with CDN. Um, or it's a architectural problem with CDN or something, but um, it, it, this is just showing that an error occurred and it's bubbling up to the user. Um, all right, and the next thing let's see, is um, errata for content hosts. Uh, previously, we only showed the errata that were applicable in the current environment for that system. So for example, in this case, in the current environment, there are only two errata that are available for installation. So this, this is exactly the same as previous. I could click those and apply. What this adds is the ability to see all errata for library. So for example, now I see all 152 errata. Let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see there's a lot more errata that apply to this system, they just aren't available. And I'm not able to check these to apply them because, like I said, they're not available in the system's environment. I would need to perform some action, some sort of uh, promotion to, to get the errata there. And in addition, I can also see the errata based on the previous environment. So if I were to promote um, the rel content view from library to dev, two additional errata would then be available. So it's sort of like a preview at, the, at a single host level. And again, I can't um, check those two because they're not actually in the environment. 
Um, and then the next thing, let me switch to a terminal. All right, uh, here, let me increase the font real quick. All right, um, so previously, the Contello installer did not really do any proxy URL validation. Um, and if you entered just like an FQDN or a host name, it uh, would not work um, because some of the underlying systems required it to be a full URI, including either HTTP or HTTPS as the uh, scheme. So uh, as part of this sprint, we added a validation. Um, so for example, this is invalid, foo.redhat.com. If I type, enter that, it thinks for a second, and if you can read that, it says uh, teleproxy URL must be a full URI, URI and only supports HTTP or HTTPS. So if I tried to enter in an FTP URI, which doesn't make any sense at all, it should give me the same error. But if I provide HTTP, it would continue. Um, and that's about it. Uh, are there any questions on any of those items? Alrighty, I will hand it over to David to talk about Docker related stuff. Oh, Partha. Well. I guess they can hear me now. Uh, let me see if I do, if I do a screen share. And get my browser working. Oh, hold on. This is right, okay. Just one second, guys. Can you all see my? Oh yeah, I can see it here. Cool. All right. So, with respect to Docker, we are using the right now. We have ability to sync repos, create, update, and delete repo operations. I'm also going to show you how to enable, uh, how to upload. We have like a demo manifest, which has bad fake URLs because the production. Docker registry is not working yet. Uh, I'm also going to show you how to enable how how to enable those repos. Like, so I'll show you on pulp admin either via pulp admin or via the pulp details the repository details page. I'm going to show that the feed URL is actually pointing to where where the registry is supposed to be in be at. Okay. So let me start. Uh, so in a typical Docker registry, if you see, there's a, so there's this URL, the feed URL, and then there's the upstream name. Okay. And the way we have written Brad, David, myself, the way we, we have it right, enabled right now, the, fair, the upstream name serves as the repository name. And based on the org URL, you'll be, you'll be creating a unique ID, unique repository ID. But It'll be pointing to the, one of these upstreams. So let me show you how that's done. Create, let's create a new product. And here's 
here I have to create a new repository. So uh, let me let me uh, I think this yesterday. So I'll just try this again today. So so the name upstream name value here. Cost increases, but this mouse is weird. Okay. Anyway. Can you make your browser a little bigger? bigger? No, sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you. Is it better? No. That's good. Okay. And I'm pointing to type to Docker. And there you go. And the URL will be repo, so it will be. There you go. So. Can save it. And should create a new Docker repo which has not been synced earlier. Yeah, obviously, we just created it. So right now it is Docker image because we haven't synced it yet. So let me start syncing. Okay. And while actually we I think it'll be we we have the same ability to do the same thing from the CLI so I can show you that I guess uh, actually no that will require switching the browser so let, let me let's finish let's wait till this gets done because I don't want to go through more complications uh, okay. should have taken a shorter repo maybe people this good enough. well okay while the sync is going on let me go and show you my CLI the CLI part so we can come back to this so we do screen share game and this one second that's the CLI yeah good yes that's good Big enough, a little bigger. Okay. Better, I guess so. You can make it bigger, Bill. Doesn't look like it actually got big. Not a bit because in the year it got bigger. All right. So here I'll show you show you the CLI part. So let me see. So hammer organization. List. So that should. Be. So there's two orgs, and let me let me sync like a doc create and sync a Docker repo with this. I conveniently have a bunch of comments, copy paste it somewhere. So I'll just use that. So, oh, sorry, I didn't create a product. Okay. Uh, I, I had a product called Docker here. So, I'm going to create the Fedora SSH repository from the registry. And I'm, I can, let me see, so I can say, I'm a, the command here. So it shows that there are two Docker repos. I guess I can just say, have repository synchronized. So it's sync, it's sync, syncing here also, and uh, there's a small bug here. When it yesterday, I just noticed it yesterday. After syncing, it prints a number which is wrong, but 
says uh, yeah, yeah, that's done. It says like 26 images sent or something. Well, it's only 12. So that's, I don't know where it got the 26 from, which I'm doing like once. Uh, yeah. So synchronization works. Let me go back to the URL, to the browser now. And we'll come back to this later. So please change it again. There you go. Hmm. It's really slow. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what is it. It's taking forever. I guess the Wi-Fi is pretty slow here. Maybe I when I tested it, I tested it in my workstation and it's faster. I can let me show you the other stuff. The so uh, can assume that the sync works. <laughs> let me go go and show you the manifest upload and enablement in my so you can. I have like a dummy manifest here that with, with the Docker stuff in it, and and it's working. Okay. This will be faster. A good test actually. Three things. Same single instance of my dev server. Hmm. Okay. There you go. At least the network will. Now, let's see. Shows uh, the is a little too big here, but you can see that there is, it uploaded a lot of stuff. And one of them will be a Docker image there. It's easier to see in the Red Hat repositories page because it's categorized better there. Classify it. There you go. So there's no RPMs in this, but there are Docker images. So you should see those there. Hmm. And you can enable this. Now okay, once it's enabled, let me go to let me go to the CLI back again. I'll just show you the pulp admin output. Oh wait, now I can show you the URI itself. Okay. So let me go to products again. Why is it small there? So that becomes small. Yeah. Actually, this is a little slow right now. All right. So you see the re the repositories that that is supposed to talk to the CDN. Uh, and Notice the URL there points to registry access redhat.com. And when, when yeah, the, this is a fake manifest, so you have like paths to Austin, whatever. But basically that's the that's the URL that points to the registry. And hopefully when the registry gets functional, we can we can see <laughs> we can see this working. Uh, yeah, that's Pretty much a need buddy questions. Let me see if the other stuff got synced. Hey, Parker, uh, I have a, a comment slash question. Any questions? Yeah, can you hear me? I guess not. So, uh, did you have a question? I, I do. You guys hear me? 
Should I do it via audio part of this? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so basically, um, I know that when you use the web UI to create a new repository, we don't really do any validation for the name. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ask the question now. I think we can hear you now. <laughs> sorry, I had, you, I had you on mute. <laughs> oh. Okay, so you can hear me now, right? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, so the web UI allows you to enter any um, kind of characters for the repository name. But we know that Docker images require uh, that the names all have to be lowercase. I think you only accept um, alphanumeric characters and underscores, right, for the name itself. So are we planning to add any kind of validation for Docker repositories? Because otherwise, as a user, if I don't see something that's very obvious to me that the name has to match these rules, um, chances are that I'm going to type whatever I want mm. and that I will only see issues when I try to synchronize later down, right, the, down down the line. So are we planning to do anything to improve the usability from, from that angle? That's a good point, Augie. So, yeah, let's yeah, create an issue for it. I think we should address that because the one thing, one thing, one special character we still had all those, the slash, I think other than that, Alf, I can, we can work on. We can, we have to add the logic to say if it's Docker, then make sure it's this. So yeah, file a bug on that. Thanks. Yeah, I'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Is that the only question or anything else? No, I can. I'm gonna unshare. Okay, hopefully folks can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so what I was going to go over, and can folks see my desktop? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, what I was going to share is um, some additional details around the Docker work that uh, was done in the sprint. So Partha kind of showed you how to create that content in Catello. Uh, what I'm going to show you is um, that that's now exposed via the installer and that clients can um, basically pull that content down. Um, so what I want to show first is uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the installer side of it. So there's just two, two small pieces that had to be added um, in order to support Docker. Uh, from a pulp point of view, it included the pulp Docker component. Um, and the, in addition to that, they also have the pulp crane, which is a web app that uh, gives a uh, client-side interface to uh, Docker pools. So the installer's been updated to pull in a couple of extra RPMs, which will expose that capability. Um, but in addition to that, the installer has also been updated to uh, create the configurations to support it. Uh, the first part is just a very small uh, config file for uh, Ukraine. Um, it just as, you know whether or not you want to debug on how often Crane is going to pull for updates uh, to content that's been published. Can you talk about Crane for a second? Like where, where it's going to be used? Sure. Um, let me just finish this real quick. And then the other is um, the endpoint and location where that content is. So what, what Crane is, is, as I mentioned, it's a web application that gives the clients a REST API uh, to perform Docker pull. Um, that's basically the only uh, API that it's providing today. It doesn't provide like a search or a find um, or say all of the, the Docker APIs today. Um, so what we're really is just exposing Docker pull uh, via Crane. Crane will be installed as part of the uh, capsule uh, or smart proxy as well as part of the uh, Catello server. Uh, I've not tested it yet on the capsule, uh, so I can't say with 100% certainty that that's there, um, but I'll do that after the demo just to confirm. Um, so anyways, from a configuration point of view, you have the crane.conf file that needed to get created by the installer, um, and all of the content is basically defaulted. Um, and then you also have a couple of Apache configurations uh, that have to get created. One is for crane, um, so that you're defining what the Apache configuration will be for uh, those Docker pulls. Um, we are configuring it for SSL um, so that it is, you know, protected access. Um, and it's, this is using a, a new Puppet module called uh, Puppet-Crane. 
Um, so we can modify that if we need to. Um, and the last component of the configuration that had to be added is the actual um, uh, module for Docker. It's very slim, it's very small, just like um, the other uh, pulp configurations. Um, so Did. It's not now. I'll not update to my screen. Can I reshare it? Sure. Can folks hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, let me reshare again. <clears throat> yeah, it's not allowing me to share. Or is click me at the bottom. Oh, I see it. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so I have content. Um, now we're looking at my browser. Um, I've created a Docker Images product. I've uh, created a few repositories for BusyBox, Fedora, and the registry. Sync those in. We can see that each one of them has Docker images. Uh, what we want to do now is actually go down to a client to pull in uh, one of those repositories so we can see that this content is consumable. Uh, what I want to note is one thing that um, remains is we have an outstanding issue of a change that you'll need to make on the client itself in order to be able to pull this content. And that is uh, due to the fact that we do have Crane set up for SSL. You need to make uh, sure that the CA has actually been added to the CA bundle. Um, so if you follow these procedures in this issue, issue 7925, um, you can set your client up until we get those code changes in place. Um, that's already been done on my client. Um, so let me go ahead and jump down to the client. If we take a look at it, this client has Docker installed, it has the Docker service running, and it has the CA uh, for Catello in the CA bundle. Um, so what we'll look at is Docker images to see if we have any, and we see that we do not. Um, we'll jump over and actually pull in one of the images. Uh, what we're going to do is actually pull in Fedora. So this is going to download um, each of the Fedora um, uh, images that's in that repository. And this is going to take about 40 seconds, so it's a, a little slow, but you know, not as slow as actually restarting my Hangout. Um, and what we'll see once this finishes is it will pull in uh, Fedora for uh, Fedora 20, 21, Rawhide, um, and also have a tag for latest, which points uh, to 21. Um, so we'll go ahead and let this finish up. Dun, 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 dun. It's taking a little longer. Apologize. Each of these images is uh, roughly 300 megabytes. Um, so okay, it's now completed. If we run Docker images now, we should see that we have several images that have gotten pulled down. 
um, with tags. Uh, you can see, like, say, light, latest has the same image ID as uh, Heisenberg, which has the same Im image as uh, Fedora 20. Um, that's because that's how Docker works, is it has these tags pointing to the actual images. Um, what I want to take a look at is, now that we have these images down on the, on the client, let's actually use one just to see, can, can I do anything with it? Um, so if I run Docker, Docker PS minus A, this is going to show me any containers that have, um, that are basically on the system that aren't currently running, um, or actually are running as well as those that are not. Um, so we can see there are none. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to run uh, a couple of these images and actually look at output and see that it did get uh, a container created. So if I take a look first to see uh, Red Hat release. So right now we're in a virtual machine, uh, the RHEL 7 virtual machine. I just want to do this so you see that the command that gets executed is done in the context within uh, the actual container and not uh, the VM itself. Um, so let me go ahead and copy one here. Okay, so what we did here is we did a Docker run of the Fedora 20 image, and we basically said cat out my, my Red Hat release, and we can see it came out as uh, Heisenberg. If I do the same thing for um, 21, I should see it say 21. If I were to say uh, latest, and it should pick whatever was latest, which was Fedora 20. So basically what we're doing here is we're instantiating containers and just running um, cat Red Hat release. So we um, can now see if we run uh, Docker PS. Um, but there are several uh, containers that got created, um, but they've already executed. So the main thing I want to show here is that what we've done is we've actually pulled content down from Catello, and then we've um, you know created some just very basic containers um, using that content. Um, let me note one more thing. Um, so one thing you'll notice here is the uh, default organization Docker images uh, Fedora 20. What that represents is the organization, uh, the repo or the yeah the repository, um, and then the actual uh, Docker uh, repo. I'm sorry, the, the product and then the Docker repository and then which tag we're using. Uh, one of the things that we want to look at is Pulp has the ability to provide kind of a mapping to give a more user-friendly name, but we need to take a look at how we can do that and still maintain the concept of organizations and content views and products, et cetera. Um, so for right now, it, it is very verbose, um, but we'd like to see if we can narrow that down. Uh, question, Partha? Yeah. Uh... I, I saw you do, you do a Docker pull. Is there a way to figure out what images are available for this client? That's what I was saying. Without a Docker search, no. So, so today, Pulp doesn't give you search. Right. So you can't see it from so here. Green doesn't have it. No, no. But what has been stated from the Pulp team is that is there is a way to install a search capability, um, and we may want to look at doing that. It's not part of. And I could, I could, if I ran Docker search by default, it's actually going to look at Docker Hub. So. so how do you, so you, you got the repo name for Pulp Ad and basically just mm -hmm. said, okay. Yeah. Basically, these are the Pulp IDs. Pulp's default behavior is if you don't specify a, an ID, it uses the Pulp ID. So in this case, it's organization, mm -hmm. content okay. view, product, Repository, just like any other Pulp ID. I wonder if you could build it in the CLI. So, yeah. Any other questions? Hey, Brad, I have a question for you. Sure. So, if you configure your Catello to go through a proxy, will Crane also uh, follow suit and, and use the proxy? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it, basically the Crane was set up uh, very similar to all of the other. Uh, content, uh, so it also supports the, the proxy config. Which part of Crane okay. uses the proxy? Actually, it would have been the, f I'm the sorry, sink. it was Pulp that, yeah. that would use the proxy. Yeah. Yeah. Syncing Docker uses the proxy, yeah. regardless of what's actually doing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, let me go ahead and unshare, and I'll give it over to David.
Can you guys see my browser? Yes. Cool. Okay, so um, one thing I worked on this past sprint that I can actually demo um, is um, a, a small bug um, relating to uh, descriptions on uh, content view versions. Before, when you went to go publish a new content view version, uh, you saw this description field, but it actually didn't do anything. Um, you would enter in something, and it would be lost. Um, but now it is actually saving, so I'm just going to show that. Um, Let me go back. Okay, so content views. Okay, go back to my content view. Go and publish a new version. Turn in a description. Save. <clears throat> and right now, you can't actually view the description in the um, UI. Um, there's a, a pull request open right now to actually create a version details page so that we can actually show it because it wouldn't fit here. Um, so there is a PR for that, and it does have a description field. Um, but I will show you from the CLI. Um, here's the, the publish command, and as you can see, it has a description option now. Um, it didn't before, um, but now it does. And if I do info on my new content view version, you can see the description field here with the description that I entered. And so it is being saved now, and you can see it in the CLI, and uh, once the open PR that Eric has for the version details page is uh, merged. You'll be able to see it in the UI as well. And also, there's an RFE, I think, to add uh, descriptions to promotes as well. And I've looked into that a little bit. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? If not, I will turn it over. Thanks, guys. So you should hear me now, and eventually see my desktop. Okay. So uh, what I was working on uh, last spring was basically uh, continuing on the steps uh, for getting form and tasks and dyn flow into the form and core, as more and more services and features uh, would use or want to use this uh, feature. So it makes sense to get into the core. And uh, step number one that is probably the, the biggest one that we needed to figure out is to support the multiple executors for the dime flow. So uh, for now, we have a limitation that uh, only one executor is basically uh, allowed to do the job, which doesn't fit well to uh, HA setups and multiple setups that the foreman uh, users uh, have quite often, and we will see more of them. Uh, as well as um, in uh, with Scott. So uh, we were discussing what uh, the first word communication to use to basically uh, talk between the executors and the clients. Um, and uh, for pragmatic reasons, it turned out that using the database for exchanging the me messages might be the uh, best one, at least for the beginning because we uh, have a shared database anyway, so using some kind of messaging technology is not uh, that useful here, and we will uh, avoid the uh, setup issues that always messaging brings. Uh, uh, we also did the architecture in a way that uh, there is a possibility to add uh, different adapters so that it's not 
uh, tied to the database, but the database is the preferred one or the uh, only one for multi-host uh, setup. We also support uh, in-memory where it doesn't use any uh, database or anything. It just goes from one uh, thread to another. So uh, I will demo first the <coughs> this running on SQLite. Sorry. So I will first, this is, I, I don't run right now uh, Foreman or Catalo. It's just an example in the Dynflow uh, directory. So I first run the observer, which runs just a console. Uh, and if I go to the console, uh, I will also show you the new experimental Dynflow up, uh, Angular console that <coughs> we have here. Uh, so there is now the register of worlds, which world is basically represents uh, the Dynflow instance. It might be at least uh, either client or an executor. So in this case, it's just the client. So it has executor to false, and it's the the observer. So it just runs the console, nothing else. Uh, now uh, I will run the. Server, and I will use the default SQLite. So when I refresh again, I probably run the observer for the Postgres, so it's not on the same database. So uh, again. So uh, this is the executor that I've run on this uh, pane, and this is the observer. So I have the, these clients, uh, two clients here. Uh, now I will run a client that will uh, that will uh, periodically send some uh, work, so create some execution plans, and want to ex uh, execute that, waiting for the result, and then executing another one. So uh, when I run that. We uh, start seeing, you know, um, it plans some action, and the executor is running that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have also some uh, example of some task that got stuck, so it's in suspended state. Uh, we'll use that later. So now I will run a second server, uh, and what happens is that the round robin. Uh, uh, Algorithm on the client starts sending uh, or spreading the work between these two executors. So now uh, this work, you know, uh, this uh, the nine three at the end got executed here, and sixty seven was executed here. Now, so uh, a part of it is also uh, better recovery and also uh, better. Uh, Handling of killing or exiting an executor. So uh, I have here some execution plan that got in the stack phase. You can see uh, in the console that there is a bit different structure here. We don't show the plan uh, run and execute tabs, and instead there are the actions structured uh, based on the way that were planned. And you can see uh, which actions had the plan, run, or finalized phase. It. This blinking around means that this is uh, actually running or in a suspended state, uh, and uh, it uh, will get updated uh, periodically. So uh, at the at the bottom of, the, of this page, uh, I will make it slower or smaller so that oh, you could see it also on the recording. There's the execution history which says which world started executing this execution plan. And what I will do now is kill the executor that is running this, this thing. Uh, so what should happen is the second executor should pick up this uh, execution plan and start working on that uh, as nothing happened. So you can uh, basically uh, restart or in HA setup. You, if you run more than one executor, you can kill uh, or stop one, and the uh, uh, work the task would continue uh, working. So in the execution history, you see that I've terminated the execution, 
on the world of this ID and the second world uh, started the execution. Uh, there's still uh, some rough edges here uh, and we need to do more uh, things in uh, exactly figuring out if some executor was uh, killed. Uh, this is just uh, one case. There are other corner cases as well, but uh, you probably got the idea. So this is for the SQLite, and we also uh, wanted to make it a bit faster because we uh, previously were using uh, the Unix sockets, and the communication was was quite uh, fast. While with this uh, dead base version. The default one is polling the uh, tables for the new messages every uh, second by default, uh, which is kind of slower. So uh, you should be able to see that. So uh, let me just run it uh, first on the SQLite. So I will again run the server here and uh, here the client and. So it's kind of you know, every every two seconds something gets executed. There is some sleep on the client side, but the main time is just waiting for the polling intervals to begin. Uh, we used quite a uh, nice feature of the Postgres. So if you run uh, this on the Postgres database, uh, we can use the listen notify feature that was introduced in Postgres 8. So I'll run server here around client, so uh, exactly the same example, just on the different database. And when I run this, you can see the difference. So uh, comparing this one and this one. So basically, the communication, uh, I have some, so the client says I have something to execute, and the server gets notified right away. Uh, and the round robin uh, works same. So when I run more servers on the Postgres, it will just start distribute work. And if I kill the executor, it will continue sending it on just the, the one that left. So we also migrated, uh, or in the middle of migration, to the concurrent Ruby gem, so that the actor implementation that we uh, have uh, in the Dynflow is now shared in the separate gem, that, and it got some more attention there. So thanks, Peter, for, for doing this job. And that's probably all I wanted to show you today. Any questions? Um, would it make sense? For satellite or Patel to run more than one executor on a single box, or is this primarily for high uh, So uh, on a single box, it should not be that different. Uh, although there is the global interpreter lock on, on the Ruby side, so we can't use the true parallel execution. Uh, we, most of the time, just waiting for the I.O. operation, which can happen in parallel. Mm -hmm. So uh, there might be some case that we uh, basically, around some thread pool, which is um, uh, right now quite uh, big. So uh, even uh, if we got a lot of work, it should not be uh, the executor should not be uh, held it, but uh, or uh, yeah, loaded too much. But uh, basically, uh, it might be. Uh, a case that you want to run executor just to increase the power, but uh, with switching to the concurrent Ruby, is the, the, this is probably not the case. So we are running the thread pool inside one executor anyway. So uh, this is basically for the HA setups. So even if we had more, I guess, CPU balance tasks, it still wouldn't make sense to run more than one. Uh, so I, I don't think that we will, we would see the difference in, in the performance of the of the satellite or the cartel too in this. So by by the HA setup you mean multiple forks or something like multiple systems so in case one goes down the other can still be running. 
so informally it's quite common if you have 10,000 of uh, nodes that you need to run multiple uh, servers, one uh, a few for the Puppet Master, ENC, and a few for uh, other things. Uh, so this is basically must have to, to be able to get to the core. OK, so if there are no more questions, I will stop sharing. And Can you hear me, David? Yes. All right. Um, so, unless there are uh, questions for anyone um, here at the end for anything they have seen so far, I do not see any questions on the Q&A app. Then uh, we will conclude the Tell Sprint 38 demo. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for all the presenters for sharing. Um, that's it. See you.